Okay. I think we're fully live now. Uh, so my name is Sanjan. I'm the CEO of Conservation International. All for joining us. Good afternoon. If it's lunchtime, like on the East Coast of Washington, which is where I am, or uh, if you're in another time zone, welcome. Um, I'm really, really excited about this first um, Instagram Live webinar event that we're doing uh, because, because I've got such a terrific guest joining us uh, today. Uh, so um, Conservation International is an organization that works in about 30 countries around the world. Our mission is to protect nature for people. So we really try to bring both uh, the value of protecting nature and and human lives and livelihoods together in our mission. Uh, and that's what we do. Uh, we have an office here in, in um, Arlington, Virginia, but we are also really around the world in Singapore, in um, Bogota, in um, Nairobi, in Cape Town, in Brussels, uh, in, uh, in Rio, uh, and so real global organization with a big focus on climate and climate change, and particularly nature-based solutions to climate change. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, our, um, our, our main guest uh, for, the, for, for, for today, uh, Christiana Figueres. And let me just give you a quick introduction to Christiana before I invite her uh, to join. Um, Christiana Figueres is an internationally recognized leader on uh, global climate change. Um, I've known her for some years, she's a friend and colleague and she has had a deep impact on Conservation International and our team here at, at CI. She was the executive secretary of the UNFCCC, which is a mouthful. stands for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change um, from 2010 to 2016. So when you hear about the, the COP conferences, the conference on, on climate change, she's the one who is essentially leading that. And she led it all the way to what is widely recognized as a um, diplomatic tour de force, a, a real high point uh, for the planet, which was the Paris Climate Agreement in 2016, when she brought, you know, subnational governments, corporations, activists, financial institutions, academics, people of faith, um, nonprofits, um, technological providers. Uh, all together to jointly deliver an unprecedented climate agreement, what is often referred to as the Paris Climate Agreements. And for this achievement, Ms. Figueres is often credited with forging a new brand of collaborative diplomacy. Since then, she's continued to work and focus on accelerating the global response to climate change. Together, together with Karnak, she founded Limited, a purpose-driven enterprise focused on social and environmental change, under which runs various initiatives, including the podcast, and I love this title of the podcast, Outrage and Optimism. And she has a new book, and here it is, and it's called The Future We Choose, Surviving the Climate Crisis by Christiana Figueres uh, and, and Tom Karnak. And, you know, look, I'll be honest with you. I don't tend to read a lot of books that are about the environment and about climate, mostly because I'm steeped in it. So it's what occupies most of my waking day. So when I escape to read a book, like what's on the shelf out there, it's fiction. I read this. And I read it essentially cover to cover. Look, there's notes in it. It was riveting. Um, not just because of what I learned about climate change, but about the process behind the negotiations that were taking place in Paris and all these amazing anecdotes that Christiana and Tom sprinkled throughout this book. It really becomes a bit of a page turner. So please get it, read it, skim it. You, I, it's a quick read um, and you'll get a lot out of it, not just about climate, but also just about your life and about personal improvement. So with that, let me see if I can add um, Christiana Figueres. Um, she's going to be joining here in a second and um, 
I have a few questions for her about her book and what she's up to these days. So we're, while we wait for her to join us, um, let me say that um, I appreciate her autographing the book for me, but more importantly, you know, um, oh, there she is. We did it, we did it. <laughs> I am so awesome. technologically incapable. It's not even, I mean, it's so sad. It's so <laughs> sad. If, you know, this is where I feel age. I mean, I don't feel it in most other parts of my life. I can still do most of the things I used to do when I was younger, but man, my attention span on technology has just really diminished. Um, good to see you. Hello. Well, attention span, and for me, it's not just the attention span, it's just the understanding, where do I click now? <laughs> <laughs> and the worry about doing something wrong. <laughs> um, thank you for joining us. I gave an introduction to your book. I hope you didn't mind. Um, and I just want to dive right in, um, if I can, um, with a few thoughts or questions. Okay. Great. So uh, a central theme in this book and something you spoke about when you came and visited our offices in Arlington, and I think really resonated particularly with sort of the millennial and younger team members at Conservation International was this word stubborn optimism. Of, of which you have many, Sandhya. Can, I, can I say, I think... how cool is it <laughs> to look over, you know, a staff meeting at CI and see the average, what is the average age? It's actually quite young. I'm always so uh, It is, I think it is, it does skew relatively young. I, I know that at least half our team members are millennials or, or sort of in that, in that category. Um, I don't exactly know, but um, it's good. It's good. People are excited. You know, when we were getting involved in this field, you know, we felt very lonely out there. And it's so amazing to see. Um, this is a digression, but we just had a job opening, a fairly senior level job. I was astonished, astonished at how many people applied and from such different varieties of life and um, um, uh, backgrounds and diverse. It was Really, really. Uh, well, and, and just to contrast, just to contrast, I have to tell you that um, I work pretty closely with um, quite a few oil and gas companies. And um, the one recurring theme of my conversations, not that I bring it up, they do, the CEOs of um, oil and gas companies is how they are so frustrated because they cannot attract young talent. They they feel that that is their major weakness right now. It's not even the dearth of capital. It's not, you know, the litigation cases that are coming against them. It's the fact that they cannot attract young talent because, of course, at least those CEOs that want to transform their companies need young talent to help them transform. And if the only thing that they can attract is, you know, us oldies, you and me in our age, well, we just don't have the imagination and, uh, and you know, the capacity to, um, to poke them constantly and remind them that more can be done. So it's very interesting. It's very, very interesting that there is basically this competition now for brains and um, and 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 it is organizations like CI that are and, definitely winning that. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate you saying so. It's a competition for brains that is no longer solely dependent on what's in your pocketbook. It's also yes. what's in your heart. Yes. And I and if you're not able as a CEO to to lay out a vision that is stubbornly optimistic, you're not going to win in that in that space. So that comes to the question that I wanted to ask. Okay. So a, a word that you use, a phrase you use is in this book is stubborn optimism. Why optimism? And then very importantly, what do you mean by, why stubborn. did you add the word stubborn? Yeah, yeah. So um, optimism for us is not um, the result of having reached a goal or an achievement. Um, we differentiate between optimism and celebration. And honestly, I don't think that we celebrate enough the, our small and large victories, and we should celebrate them more. But that's different than optimism. For us, optimism is not the result of having achieved something, but rather quite the opposite. It's the deliberate input 
with which we approach a challenge. And whether that's for your own personal challenges with your health or, you know, any new skill that you want to learn, um, or whether that's a planetary challenge such as climate change, anything in between. If we go at a challenge thinking that we're not going to be able to solve it, then it's going to be very difficult to solve. And, you know, pro po possibly the best example right now is scenes. If you know, I don't hear people and I don't people saying we will never be able to develop a COVID vaccine. Had that attitude, we wouldn't. I hear and what I read is people saying it's difficult, but there are many different companies and countries trying. Everyone is really doing their absolute best. And there is a determination to be able to get a vaccine that is effective and that is accessible to everyone. If we didn't have that determination, then we wouldn't be able to. So it's a very good example of the kinds of attitudes and the kind of the attitude and the mindset that we think is necessary for anything, including climate change. And we call it stubborn because it's very obvious that um, that that climate is or any other challenge is is what they call a wicked problem, right? Very, mm -hmm. very difficult to solve because of its complexity. Um, but if we let that complexity or in fact, even if we let one barrier overcome our sense of commitment and uh, when we just whole, fall into the hole of despair, then we've paralyzed ourselves. And so we have to be very stubborn about continuing to nurture our commitment and our determination to move ahead. And that determination, I think you put so beautifully in your book, um, you watching a, a, a protest outside your, you know, your, your office and then seeing a, a 11 year old girl carrying a sign that says on the sign, the oceans are rising and so are we. And I, I love that. So let me ask you, this book was published in 2020 and already the world has shifted. So yeah. if you were to add something to this, what would you add to the book in view of the, um, I guess, slightly hopeful, but also remarkable conversation that is taking place in America, but also the, around the world, in regard to race, historical injustice, and inequity? You know, I, I would add something that is there in the book, but, uh, but that I think uh, deserves much more depth, which is the transformational realization mm -hmm. of interconnection among all living beings, us as humans, all of the other, um, all of the other beings, whether it be flora or fauna, uh, we are so interdependent of each other when you think about it. And, and, and somehow we think that we're over here and nature is over there, or that we're over here and other humans are over there, that I have nothing to do with the woman who's bearing a baby right now in the Sahel. We, we, we tend to, build mental barriers around ourselves mm -hmm. and t and convince ourselves that we are impervious to other things that are going on. And that is so untrue. And uh, I think the understanding of the interconnection of all of us with each other, as well as all of us with nature, is something that we totally have to become much more fluent in much, much more fluent in. And of course, our greatest teacher there is na nature herself, right? She, everything that nature does um, is done in an interconnected way. And, um, and, and it's almost like she's operating there in full view of us so that finally we're gonna get the point. Um, and, and I don't think that that understanding is there yet in the depth that it should be. So I would add, you know, interconnection of all living beings. Do you see that, you know, you've worked so much in order to persuade companies in particular that it's in their own enlightened self-interest to get ahead of the curve and to be right there when it comes to climate change. And, and you're seeing that progress. And now they have another mandate, which they have been, many of them, some of them have done great, but many of them have been woefully lacking in, and that is racial justice and uh, inequality and inequity 
in just in general, whether you're American or global. Uh, and the Black Lives Matter movement, certainly in this country, and also I would say in Europe and, and some other parts of the world as well. I, in, for me, I see great allies uh, in my mission and in the mission of folks who are fighting for racial justice. Um, do you see that as well? And do you see these two things as so interconnected that pushing one push helps push the other and vice versa? I do, I do. Um, and I think, you know, we used to think about all of these crises as sort of standing next to each other, whether it's the biodiversity loss crisis or the climate crisis or the racism crisis um, or the human rights crisis. Um, and the fact is the inequality crisis. And we used to think about them because we humans tend to think and act in silos, maybe because that's easier to put your arms around a particular issue and in order to understand it, we build these artificial silos. But the fact is that I, I think that COVID has really given us so many lessons. Mm. And one of them is um, especially because it, it hit and then immediately after we had the racial crisis in the United States and, uh, and in several other countries, I think the big lesson from this is there is no such thing as a crisis over here and a crisis over there. Actually, all of these crises converge with each other. And hence, the solutions have to converge as well. And that's where I totally agree with you that operating productively and in a healing manner and an improving manner on one crisis will have beneficial effects on the others. It will not take us to where we want to go, but we have to be able to address any crisis in full view of of the um, of all of the factors that intermingle and interconnect, and not go at one crisis say the climate crisis, without considering human rights, without considering inequality, without considering racism. It just doesn't exist. That only exists in our little feeble brain, right? Right. Um, but in reality, yeah. that's not the way, that's not the way life is. It's certainly not the way nature operates. So, you know, I think this much more integrative approach uh, of, all these issues being going hand in hand is, um, is something that we're beginning to learn and we better accelerate that. Yeah, because certainly when you, when you step back and you look at it from a global perspective, you know, the folk, the people who in some ways are least responsible for getting us to where we are regarding uh, the climate catastrophe have to bear the burden the most mm -hmm. and are being told, listen, you have to slow down your pathways to development while we who have already reached it are happy to hold on to what we have and maybe even add to it in the, in the process, which, which seems deeply, deeply unfair, you know, from any perspective. But you have a really unique way of coming at this because, I mean, the, you, you use this great analogy that um, I, didn't, I didn't know this story particularly, but you sort of talk about Nelson Mandela as he was leaving Robben Island, leaving the prison, uh, uh, for the last time, uh, um, uh, and he's thinking to myself, to himself, if I don't forgive my jailers before I get out of the walls of this prison, I'll never be able to forgive them. And he knew that to leave the country, particularly without bloodshed, um, which was very expected and to some extent understandable, he would have to transcend to that moment. Yeah. yeah. What you, you had to kind of, channel that when you had to deal with this, the global south, if you will, developing countries, countries like Sri Lanka that I'm from, or West Africa, Sierra Leone, where I grew up in, or Costa Rica, for that matter, where you're from, saying, hey, we will walk away from a bad deal rather than accept a good deal, uh, uh, rather than accept a suboptimal deal, whereas the rich countries are saying, you know, we don't want to give up anything. How did you manage to bridge that without ending up into the blame game? 
Yeah. Well, and, and the blame game is, um, is, is so pernicious and it is so dangerous because I honestly, Sanjan, I, I cannot remember my personal experience, any um, blaming dynamic that I have ever participated in or that I have witnessed that has a positive ending. <laughs> and, um, and I think, you know, that's true, not just for me, but for, um, for anyone else. And um, I mean, it's tempting, obviously, to blame someone else for things that we're not happy with, for being um, affected, for being most vulnerable. It's very tempting. And in fact, it's justified. Let's just put it that way, right? It's justified. The question is, however, does it solve the problem? Does mm. it get me any farther? And the answer to that is definitely no. Definitely no. And so we, at some point, we just have to decide either in our personal life, and I'm doing this in many different aspects of my personal life, but also in our organizational and our work on the global level, we, we have to decide, do we want to be right about having been right about an argument? Or do we want to let go of that self-justification and actually be able to produce a better quality life for everyone, for myself, if it's, you know, do I want to be right or do I want to be happy? Do I want to blame the other countries or do I want to actually be able to achieve the kind of sustainable development that I want for my citizens? It's practically a choice. If I as a country stay there in the hole of feeling victimized and blaming the countries of the North for the disaster that they have uh, that they have occasioned, which is true, it's a mathematical truth, um, then it's true and I can feel very self-justified, but it doesn't help me advance the conditions of life that I want for my citizens. But it's very hard to break, isn't it? I mean, look, even in my own personal life, it's so much easier to sort of go into the, you know, it's, it's your fault. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, it's so easy. It's and, so um, easy and it's so, so justifiable and it's so understandable. But you, you mentioned Mandela. I mean, Martin Luther King is another very good example, right? It's difficult. But honestly, Sanya, if we want to move ahead on climate, on, um, on racial issues, on human rights issues, we've got to be able to take that step. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, so I want to ask you about a word that you used that I thought was fantastic in the book called bright mind. What's the concept of having a bright mind? Well, I, I think we've, um, we've talked about it a little bit. Um, and, and the bright mind is the concept that actually comes from, uh, from the Buddha. Um, and it's the concept of being able to have a broad view of um, anything that is happening and at the same time extract yourself from being in the middle of it because the moment that you put yourself in the middle of it then you do fall into this hole of victimization and despair and around climate i mean just the utter abyss of despair right, right, right. and so to have a bright mind is to be able to find a space between what you see occurring and how you react to that. So to move away from the automatic reaction, but rather to have a space and decide how do I act? Not how do I react, but how do I act in the face of what I'm seeing? And if you really ask yourself, how do I act? then you have empowered yourself because you have so many more resources from which you can draw to act in a wiser, less judgmental way that usually has a better result. So it's that space creation between, you know, what we're seeing and, and, and it's difficult to do. I will totally admit because every time something happens, you know, we are right there in the hole and, you know, we get our fighting gloves on and we go at it. And so to train yourself to have that space and say, okay, okay, I see what is going on. Mm -hmm. What can I do to help? Not easy, but honestly, transformational. Yeah, I, I thought that concept in that part, I actually went back and read it again because I, I thought it had so much application 
to the climate catastrophe that we're facing, uh, that we're in, but also to other parts of our lives. And I, yes. I, I love that section in the book. So you go into these actions you can I think I paused for a second here, but the, the 10 actions you can take. And one of them that you talked about is protecting and reforesting, uh, you know, the world and you specifically go into the Amazon. Um, that's the piece that Conservation International really leans in on, these natural climate solutions, nature-based solutions, protecting nature, particularly forests, mangroves, grasslands, restoring them and managing them better in order to mitigate um, climate change and, and provide a buffer to it. But they're not easy to do and they're sometimes controversial. How do you see nature-based solutions, protecting the Amazon, planting trees as part of the overall response to climate change? Well, first of all, sorry to, you know, do another COVID reference, but we're all so COVID obsessed mm. right now. It, I, I don't know how it is in the United States, but um, Sandra. It's, but it's here, bad. Like, let's, it, I know, I know, but how are people bad. reacting to it? Because here in Costa Rica, what is absolutely consistent yeah. is people saying, I want to leave the city and I want to go to nature. Hmm. That is consistently the desire that comes up. I want to go to the beach. I want to go to a volcano. I want to go walk in the forest. I want to go hug a tree. I want to go plant a tree. Um, that is consistently the desire that people are having. And I think that's been so interesting and such a rebirth of, um, of the meaning of nature in our lives. And, and, and for that, I'm, I'm really very, uh, very grateful. And I hope that's going to be one of the sticky lessons once we're out of the COVID, uh, COVID crisis to really respect and, um, and honor that very important role that nature plays in our lives. Um, but, but beyond that, I, I think we've gone through, historically, we've gone through several periods of how we see nature-based solutions. And um, we are fortunately coming out now out of a period in which there was an incredible amount of criticism about nature-based solutions because they were seen by some, not by everyone, certainly not by you and me, but by some, they were seen as greenwashing or as um, buying indulgences like they used to do in the medieval times. Um, and as, as sort of an excuse not to do the tough homework of yeah. reducing emissions at yeah. home, in your corporation, in your country. And, um, and, and therefore, because of that, they got a really bad rap. And I think fortunately we're coming out of that and we're understanding that the fact is that we need both to reduce emissions in all of the energy field, whether it's electricity or transport or manufacturing industry, wherever. We totally need to reduce those emissions. And at the same time, we also need to invest into nature-based solutions. It's not an either or situation. It's an and also. They are totally complementary. And of course, the fact is that nature-based solutions have so many intrinsic benefits, even in addition to climate, right? Because they help us um, restore and balance aquifers. They help with the human rights of the people who are there. They certainly help us with biodiversity loss, another of the crises that we're dealing with. Um, they just have so many intrinsic benefits on their own, in addition to the benefits that we get on climate and on carbon absorption. So no matter from what point of view you see it, whether you see it from the social point of view, whether you see it from the biodiversity point of view, whether you see it from the climate point of view, it is just, you know, a, a, an overlap of um, imperatives that make this just very difficult to say no to um, yeah. Yeah. And, and something that we have to accelerate. Um, I want to end by asking you um, a question about where your sort of both courage and, and kind of optimism comes from. What's the root? cause of that? Is it your love of nature? Is your sense of duty? Is it your kids? And I, I want to recount um, something that I didn't know, given that I was there. You know, you had 25,000 people at this Paris Climate Conference. 
um, is held in an old aircraft hangar. It was raining, I remember. Damp, cold, not necessarily the most pleasant environment to pack 25,000 people in. And you can imagine trying to do that today. And you get this phone call that the, the Secret Service, but the security that the French government had provided, um, found a bomb in the metro station that leads right to the convention, which your daughters were there at the time, were using twice a day. And you had to decide whether or not you were going to, you know, cancel it or hold it back or whether we were still going to go forward with this conference, knowing what you knew, knowing that your kids were directly involved in it. In this case, you persevered. It turned out to be the right decision to make. It may not have been, or we might have had a different outcome, depending on what unfortunately or fortunately happened. Where does your sense of courage, sense of hope, optimism come from? Um, because I think that's an important thing for folks to understand as they both read the book, but also think about what they need in their lives to channel a path forward. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, definitely one of the most difficult moments I've ever faced in mm. my life. Um, and just to put the bigger context around that, uh, we started the Paris negotiations just two weeks after the terrorist attacks in Paris. In Paris, I'm doing um, that, yeah. Just absolutely deadly terrorist attacks. And that is why the whole of the UN procedure there was under highest alert, because um, by the time we started, they had not found all of the terrorists and they were still you know, trying to figure out where they were and what they were up to. And the fact that we had attracted 150 heads of state to come to Paris and be together on one day under one roof. You can imagine for a terrorist attack, that is like the sweet spot, right? One, one attack on one building on one day and you get rid of 150 heads of state. So understandably we were under highest alert now um a few days after the heads of state left fortunately we did find this bomb uh and uh and it was a very difficult moment because i had to choose between a suggestion that came from security um about canceling the whole thing or go forward and as you said you know my children but 25,000 other people were going through that station daily basis. Um, and it, it, it was difficult, but it honestly took me only a few minutes because I realized that in terms of climate change, we have to do what is necessary. It's not good enough to say, uh, I the best I could. Hmm. The best I could is not enough because we've been doing the best that we can or that we could for decades. Hmm. If you take a look at what we've been doing since, climate, since we've understood the threat of climate change, we've been doing quote unquote, the best that we could. Well, that is not enough because obviously we are not on track to address climate change. So, for any of us as an individual, as an organization, as a country to say, uh, yeah, I know climate change, but I'm doing the best I can. I'm sorry. Yeah. That is not enough. We have to do what is necessary. And very often, as in that case, it's a very difficult thing to do. But it's the only thing that we can do if we're going to look at ourselves in the mirror and be able to face ourselves. Thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with everyone today. Um, folks, the future we choose, I promise you it's a fast read. It's a really interesting read. Even if you understand the topic of climate change, you're gonna find stuff in here that's applicable to your life. And that's just deeply inspiring and just fun and interesting and, um, and, and action oriented. So uh, please take a look at it. Uh, Christina Figueres, great friend to conservation, a true champion for nature. Thank you so much for being with us. Bye-bye.